everyone could take their seats, uh, please, we'd like to get started again. So this morning we spent some time unpacking polarization and division a little bit with uh, public opinion polling research and some of the other qualitative research studies that uh, we've done at Positive Energy and then recognizing that certainly Canada's energy future in an age of climate change is going to involve uh, many different energy technologies, hence the panel around um, social acceptance and polarization, public attitudes towards, uh, towards technologies. This session we want to now move into solution space. We want to move into, okay, so now that we know everything that we know from this morning and from our own individual and collective experiences, where should we take things and what are some bright lights for, uh, for moving forward? Um, so we've got a, a mix of researchers, uh, activists, practitioners uh, on the panel. Many have completed work in multiple uh, different sectors, which I think is one of the strengths. I like to think of the work that we do, uh, bringing that multi-sectoral uh, perspective. Before we get started, we're going to show you a brief video. So at Positive Energy, we've got for this next three-year phase a kind of a suite of research methods that uh, we're using. You've seen some of the work this morning, the public opinion polling survey uh, work with general the general public, also with uh, decision makers. Uh, we've got case studies uh, that, uh, that we're undertaking, and you've seen some of the work uh, that we did uh, looking at different forms of renewable technologies, looking at carbon capture and, and, and sequestration. Another one of our methods for this next three years is what we're calling what works, which is in essence case studies to try to look at what has been tried to address uh, different issues uh, in the energy sector and what can we learn from those. So as people will know, this conference is focused in on polarization and, and division. So we've identified a number of different approaches that have been tried here in Canada and internationally to address polarization. I think from our perspective, what we want to do is, you know, take a, a rigorous dive into those case studies to try to get an understanding of what elements of them were successful and elements of them were less, uh, less successful. Um, and Part of that, I think, is with a view to not wanting to continue to try the same things over and over again and expect, uh, expect different results. My own view is that we're in a process of unprecedented experimentation uh, on these issues, and so the more that we can bring uh, to those discussions and to those challenges uh, from a research perspective and an engagement perspective at Positive Energy, uh, we're very delighted to, to do so. So we're going to start the session off with a brief uh, video which gives you a bit of a sense of what we're working on for these various uh, case studies. They're in a variety of different uh, levels of, of completion. One of the um, research uh, leads for um, one of the case studies is participating on this panel. Dwayne uh, Bratt, who's a member of our research team, and other members of the team who are working on those case studies are sort of scattered throughout, uh, scattered throughout the audience here. So we'll start with that, and then we will get the panel underway. My case study is of the Alberta Climate Leadership Plan. In May of 2015, Rachel Notley and the NDP um, ended 44 years of progressive conservative government rule in the province of Alberta and won a majority election. Soon after she was elected, she appointed a panel led by Andrew Leach, an energy economist at the University of Alberta, to investigate uh, a climate plan. Several months after that, in November of 2015, Rachel Notley announced her climate leadership plan. On stage with her were industry leaders, uh, the CEOs of Canadian Natural, of Shell, of Suncor, uh, environmentalists uh, from Greenpeace, the Pemmity Institute, um, and uh, Indigenous leaders such as the Grand Chief of Treaty 6 we're all on stage with Rachel Notley. If you were going to design a policy that would deal with climate change, that would deal with political polarization, that would deal with federalism, in a, in a sense, this is what you would want. You would want the government working with industry, working with environmental groups, working with indigenous groups. It, it outlined a number of different strategies, 
the phasing out of coal, a cap on oil sands emissions, and most significantly, an economy-wide carbon tax. It was designed for many reasons. It was to reduce Alberta's greenhouse gas emissions. It was to help transition to a green energy future. It was to rebuild Alberta's reputation as a climate laggard around the world. And it was designed to provide social license uh, for the development of oil and gas pipelines while they transition to a, to a green economy. It was designed to address climate change. It was designed to reduce political polarization and it was designed to have renewed federalism. And yet four years later, Jason Kenney, leader of the United Conservative Party, won a majority government in the 2019 provincial election where his number one issue was repealing the climate leadership plan. Kenney wins a majority government and by June, the climate leadership plan was dead. Um, and it died for a number of reasons. It, it died because a pipeline was not built. Uh, there was a sense that it was uh, a taxation without dealing properly with, with climate change, or some people not even believing in climate change. There were some communication problems uh, with it, particularly by getting support of elite groups and not mass groups, and a variety of other factors. The purpose of this case study is to figure out how Notley created the Climate Leadership Plan in the first place and how instead of lowering political polarization, it actually inflamed political polarization that led to Kenny repealing it several years later. We'll also look at the legacy uh, of Alberta's Climate Leadership Plan and much of that legacy is going to depend on the October 21st federal election. If Trudeau is elected with a minority or a majority government, or if Andrew Scheer is elected with a minority government, it is highly likely that the carbon tax federal backstop will continue. That federal backstop would not have been in place in 2016 in the absence of Alberta's plan. So ironically, while it was repealed within Alberta, there is a legacy of the Alberta plan at a federal stage. Thank you. The Ecofiscal Commission is an independent organization whose mission is the mainstreaming of fiscal solutions to environmental pollution in Canadian policy. The focus of positive energies uh, interest in the Commission's work is really on carbon taxation, but other topics tackled by the Commission include water and wastewater pricing and congestion charges in cities. The organization consists of the Commissioners, a group of Canadian economists who are interested in policy applications of their research findings, an advisory board that provides strategic guidance, and a small group of staff. The Ecofiscal Commission has broadened its communication efforts over time, publishing blog posts and engaging on social media, but the core audience for the Commission's research has always been decision makers at all levels of governance. The Ecofiscal Commission was established in 2014 and its five-year mandate will end later this year. So far in our research, we've learned that the Commission's key strategy for depolarizing the discourse around carbon taxes in Canada has been to build a credible, consistent, and independent brand. The evidence on carbon taxes presented in Ecofiscal reports has been developed by over a dozen of the country's best-known independent economists. In addition, Ecofiscal's advisory board includes senior decision makers from various industries, um, but also environmental thought leaders and um, politicians with various affiliations. Again, this broad buy-in promotes a perception of independence and it builds credibility. The push for independence is also reflected in the organization's funding model, with stable long-term funding coming from major Canadian foundations. To sum up, over the years and through changing political climates, the Ecofiscal Commission has built on this strategy um, to deliver consistent messaging on pricing carbon and pricing environmental pollution, backed by research and evidence 
which is standing in stark contrast to the politicized and polarized wider discourse on the issues in Canada. The NRT was an independent policy advisory agency created under the auspices of progressive conservative Prime Minister Brian Mulroney's government in 1987 and designed to report to the Canadian government. It was created in response to the UN document of the time, Our Common Future, and its primary mandate was to raise awareness amongst Canadians and especially amongst Canadian governments about the challenges of sustainable development. It was designed to be an explicitly non-partisan body, and it was populated by dozens of leaders and experts with expertise in a wide diversity of areas. This included energy and waste, forestry, transportation, climate change and air pollution, and a lot of other areas. Members were appointed by the federal government, and they came from universities, government, the private sector, environmental NGOs, public policy groups, and Indigenous and community representatives from across the spectrum of Canada. In 2013, Stephen Harper's government defunded the NRT and effectively ended its operation. They argued that much of the information released by the group was in the public domain and that its mandate was no longer necessary. Critics challenged that the late reports by the NRT had advised for the adoption of carbon pricing and they were too politically charged for the Harper administration. The creation of the NRT was driven by seven primary factors in its institutional design. Cross-Canadian regional representation, voluntary advice, high-profile and cross-partisan leadership embedded in its ranks, consensus-driven recommendations, high levels of multidisciplinary expertise, and representation amongst many forms of stakeholders. NRT recommendations were explicitly non-prescriptive Action on them was designed to be voluntary advice for Parliament. Further, those reports were consensus driven and they represented a balancing and reconciliation of the challenges of economic development and environmental sustainability. The mandate of the organization was based on an explicit idea that the two challenges must be reconciled and they couldn't be addressed in isolation from each other. For 25 years, many, but definitely not all, recommendations embedded in NRT reports were adopted by leaders across the, the political spectrum, but they were often adopted or adjusted. Thanks so much. In 2018, the Government of Canada announced it would accelerate the phase out of coal power plants by 2030 which are a major contributor of global CO2 emissions. Four provinces will be affected by the phase-out, Alberta, Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. More specifically, there are nearly 50 communities with nearby coal mines or generating stations. In that context, just transition means that the cost of transitioning to a low-carbon economy is split across society. The coal workers and communities should not have to bear the cost of transition alone. In April 2018, 11 people from diverse backgrounds, labor unions, corporate sector, environmental and academic sector, municipal government, were appointed by Canada's Minister of Environment and Climate Change to be part of a task force whose mandate was to engage with workers and communities affected by the coal phase out and provide recommendations as to what to include in a just transition plan. These 11 people were intended to be representative of the broader group of stakeholders. Also, the task force was asked to advise to the federal government on to how to structure subsequent phases of consultation and analysis concerning just transition. The task force held consultation with 15 Canadian coal communities affected by the coal phase out to hear their concerns. It was the opportunity to establish a two-way dialogue between the task force and the affected communities. In these consultations, the task force fostered a climate of respect and trust. It was a space for everyone to express their concerns, whatever they were, and also an opportunity to, for the task force members to reassure the communities and underline the strength. For instance, the task force aimed to reassure workers who were frightened to lose their home and their pension fund that their skills acquired in the coal industry were required across the economy.
These consultations inform two reports with 10 recommendations to the federal government on concrete actions to accompany the coal phase out. These actions include ensuring locally available support for communities, providing workers a pathway to retirement, transitioning workers to sustainable employment, investing in community infrastructure and securing funding for community planning, collaboration, diversification and stabilization. So those case studies are still in progress, but I think what I wanted to just point out to you about them is that, you know, you'll recall our mandated positive energy is how do we strengthen public confidence in decision-making arrangements? So the aim of these case studies is really to dig into what are some things that have been tried in the past to try to strengthen public confidence in decision-making, and notably in this case, for our purposes, when it comes to Canada's energy future in an age of climate change. And I also just wanted to take a moment to um, point out that a number of those researchers are here uh, in the room. So Stephen Bird, who you saw this morning, is somewhere, Stephen? Yes, there. Uh, Sébastien Gérard Lindsay is uh, at the back. Uh, Sébastien is a doctoral candidate uh, with us. He's working uh, with Brendan Frank, who is our interim research director, while Marissa Beck is on uh, maternity leave. So feel free uh, to connect with any of those researchers. And of course, Duane is on the panel if you're interested in learning more. I think the other thing I would like to point out is that we had a list about this long of cases that we could undertake. So I know that there are people in this room who would say, why didn't you work on us? Well, please do let us know if there are, you know, um, uh, initiatives uh, that you've been involved in or that you would want to draw to our attention uh, because this is the first of a three-year project. I'm looking at Chad, for example, at uh, uh, Energy Futures Lab. And we're certainly interested in the idea of continuing the case study work, but as we move forward with, uh, with the project. Um, um, so without further ado, I'm going to give you over to the panel. Uh, just a very quick word on Meredith Adler. So Meredith uh, sits on our advisory uh, council for positive energy. We're absolutely delighted um, that she does. It was really important for us. I mean, we are a research and engagement shop. And the engagement piece, one of the things that we've talked about increasingly in our language now is engaging seasoned and emerging energy leaders, which means youth. Uh, so we're delighted to have Meredith sit on our advisory council as executive director for student energy. She's already having an impact on uh, how and, and, and the way we do things. So looking forward to uh, this panel. Thanks, Meredith. who can't use technology. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so uh, I'm the executive director with Student Energy. Uh, we're a global charity that works in um, with about 50,000 youth in 150 different countries on creating the next generation of energy leaders. And we work across the spectrum on energy with corporates, governments, um, and other organizations around the world who are interested in youth, youth engagement and uh, this crucial education question. Um, before we kick off fully, I'm going to ask Dwayne if you would like to expand a little bit on um, your case study and help to set the stage here. The power button is very high. There we go. All right. <laughs> is that working? It was. We're down to one. Down to one working um, middle-aged guy who can't work technology either. <laughs> So what I, well, the 2015 election really needs to be emphasized in Alberta. Um, when you change a government for the first time in 44 years and change ideologies for the first time at about 80, it's, it's an important milestone. Um, and uh, the other thing to remember is the NDP were not expected to win. And this isn't just me saying it, this is the NDP saying it in January of 2015, where their strategy for victory was to win 10 seats. Um, they won 52. Um, 
So then they win this unexpected uh, victory and they quickly are inundated with all sorts of requests to, to deliver on a lot of different programs. So on the issue of climate, they did not campaign on a carbon tax. This does not mean it was a hidden agenda, as would be argued in the 2019 election. It was just something that they hadn't thought of. But when they formed their cabinet, they put Shannon Phillips, who was one of their star candidates out of Lethbridge, in the environment portfolio. I would argue Shannon Phillips was the most important cabinet minister that Rachel Notley had. She wasn't the environment minister. She was also the de facto energy minister. Um, and so that was an important moment that, that gave heft to this. Then the appointment of Andrew Leach, uh, energy economist at the University of Alberta, to pursue this public uh, consultation. And it was significant public consultation. There were two open houses, one in Calgary, one in Edmonton, that drew over 1,000 people in uh, early September. They had an online survey that attracted 25,000 respondents. There were separate Aboriginal engagements. There were 10 technical briefings. Um, this was all done uh, through the, uh, the Leach panel. Um, but there was a separate pathway, a more private pathway that was going on simultaneously. Before the 2015 election, there was already high level discussions between some of the biggest um, oil and gas companies in Alberta, CNRL, uh, Suncor, uh, Synovus, and some of the biggest environmental organizations, uh, the Pemina Institute um, and uh, Environmental Defense and Forest Ethics, were already meeting privately. The Notley government joined those uh, meetings. And the combination of those two things, the public panel and the private negotiations, is what led to the outline of the, uh, of the climate leadership plan. It was a coal phase out of 2030. It accelerated Stephen Harper's coal phase out by saying there will be no coal in Alberta post 2030. Uh, the emissions cap on the oil sands, which became controversial amongst environmentalists and academics who were not part of the negotiations <laughs> because the highest degree of emissions prior to the cap of 100 megatons was 69 megatons. And so it was this idea that it could expand to 30, but in the deal was made, we'll expand the emissions cap and actually have a cap in exchange for support amongst environmentalists for the pipeline, as well as at a minimum, just don't say anything about the pipeline. Uh, they, maybe they should have brought some BC environmentalists on as well, uh, but that did not happen. But the Alberta ones, Ed Whittingham, for example, who was a frequent target of the UCP, they, in fact, they put his name in the policy doctrine as one of their promises to fire Ed Whittingham, um, which is quite rare. I was glad my name wasn't there. <laughs> <coughs> But Ed Whittingham continues to defend the Trans Mountain Pipeline in, in, and says that this was a key part of these private discussions. So that was the intervention, was those two aspects. There's a long section about why this failed. Um, and most of it was on the video, but one, a couple others I would add is bringing in a carbon tax in the middle of the most severe economic recession in the province in decades uh, was, was a major, obviously a major problem. Then we start to look at the legacy, and that's when I think that the story changes because at first blush, it would appear to be an absolute disaster, that you have the opposition party campaigning against it, winning a majority government, quickly through Bill 1, dismantling the carbon tax, but there's a federal legacy, and that federal legacy is I don't believe there would have been a federal climate plan in the absence of what Alberta did first. Uh, Justin Trudeau um, spoke to the Petroleum Club when he was the leader of the third party in 2013 where he said what a government needed to do was support pipelines to get market access in exchange for a price on carbon. He said that in 2013. He could not do that after election unless Alberta had a plan. No liberal, especially a liberal with the last name Trudeau, would impose a policy like this if Alberta hadn't gone first. And in fact, when he brought his policy through, the four largest provinces, Quebec, Ontario, BC, and Alberta, all had a climate plan. Kenny was, uh, Doug Ford, of course, ends the Ontario plan. Kenny ends the Alberta plan. 
But unless Andrew Scheer wins a majority government, and I wouldn't put high numbers on that if you were betting, uh, the climate, uh, the federal backstop is going to continue. Um, it was the, the grand bargain of pipelines for, uh, for uh, carbon tax was the centerpiece of the Trudeau government. They are not going to get rid of that if they're reelected. And even if Scheer is in a minority, he is not going to be able to repeal that, that because that requires legislation. So ironically, the Notley plan failed in the province that it was presented in, but has a lasting, again, we'll see on the 21st, but a lasting legacy across the rest of the country. Thank you, Dwayne. So I'm going to take a moment to set the stage here a little bit, and then I'll have the rest of our panelists introduce themselves. Um, and there is a little bit of audience participation today. So um, the first thing I'd like you all to do is write down or think to yourself, what is it you feel when you hear the word polarization? A feeling, a sentiment. And then we're going to come back to this in a second. So. Um, so, so far today, we've had a lot of facts and figures and interesting research, really, around polarization and on how people are seeing this, what we're seeing in studies. Um, and now our task on this panel is to figure out some core solutions for moving forward. And so that's why we started with the case study. I'm so glad that Dwayne was here to present his research as well. Um, but I think it's a really interesting time to be talking about that. Um, as I mentioned, I'm... I've been doing a lot uh, with youth and youth empowerment and energy. Um, and across the world last week, we had, Catherine, help me with the number, six million people? Uh, almost eight. Eight million um, marching on climate. And here in Canada, we had seven or 800,000 people as well, which if you think about it, is actually a really substantial percentage of our population. And, and it's an interesting thing because obviously for climate and climate change, Greenhouse gas emissions are front and center, but we also live in the country with the highest per capita energy use of anywhere in the world. And so for us, it's a critical piece um, because I think a lot of these opposing facts really are leading deeply to where we see polarization. And in Canada and around the world, it has become deeply personal for many people. I mean, you do have on Twitter grown men thinking it's really appropriate to berate small Swedish teenagers um, and, and make threats against them. And, and that's, I think, a whole new level of where we're seeing this. But then I think we're also looking at some really radical collaborations and some interesting solutions coming forward and new types of people talking to each other that haven't spoken to each other. Catherine and I were just talking about how this was happening a bit in New York on the fringes of the climate summit. Um, and so with that, I think we'd like to set the stage for how do we start looking into solutions here in Canada. Um, and I'd like someone to volunteer, perhaps. What is it that people in this room feel when they think about polarization? Yes. Anxiety. This is a very quick moment. Anybody else? Ginny? Fear. Chad? Uh, creative tension. Creative tension. Excellent. I think, thank you, audience participants. Um, I think this is essentially what a lot of people are feeling in Canada, is not just necessarily around polarization, but that there is an opportunity out there. But then also, operating from a place of fear, operating from a place of anxiety is really challenging. And so that's something I'm going to challenge you all to kind of think through um, as we go through our panel and hear from our panelists about their background. We have a very, a very diverse panel, I think, today. And so it'll be exciting to see what we can all come up with together. And so I'll ask you all to introduce yourself in about three minutes, and we can start with Norman. Hi, I'm Norman Mousseau. I'm director of the Trottier Energy Institute at, Univers at Polytechnic and professor at the University of Montreal. So the Trottier Energy Institute is, uh, has been funding for a few years. We've produced a number of uh, work. We did uh, this Trottier Energy uh, Outlook, uh, Canada Energy Outlook uh, last year, so it was mentioned already. But we, already, we also have, we are not, technologically uh, determined, so we look at the whole question of the energy transition. And we've been working with, uh, among other things, also creating uh, consensus. We work with the provincial government and the uh, parties in Quebec uh, to try to restructure the governance, environmental governance. And also I've been, a, I'm a member of a, one of the founder of the Transition Accelerator with James Meadowcroft and uh, David Lazel. 
who try to reformulate this uh, this approach to climate change and energy transition in a, in a way that is more uh, more concrete than what we've been doing now by reformulating and looking at sectorial that are larger matter, but looking at other problems, looking at other issues that we can address while at the same time reducing greenhouse gas emission. And this has allowed us to propose solutions that avoid this polarization. So one way of uh, talking about polarization is just to go around it. And that's one of the mandate of the transition accelerator. So I I'll can speak more, but I'll pass for now. Okay, uh, my name is Patrick McCurdy. I'm a, an associate professor here at the University of Ottawa in the Department of Communications. Uh, my research since about 2013, I've looked at sort of the visual representation of how, how the question I asked was how have different stakeholders from NGOs to corporations to government, how have they represented the oil sands or tar sands in their promotional material, anywhere from their video advertisements to the, uh, to the policy, to, to the different documents, government websites. And so that resulted in me creating an uh, online database of about 2,000 images on mediatoil.ca. Uh, it was a partnership with computer science where you could search and see the different images which were there. Um, and then doing some analysis uh, of that. We stopped, uh, stopped data collection at the end of 2015, although I have been archiving different ads. As they come up, I just haven't upload, uploaded them to the database. One other, one other thing I produced, uh, it came out in April 2018. I can pass a couple copies around to look. At is a graphic novel. I co-developed it with uh, Ad Astra Comics to try and look at the, what are the different sort of tropes and images which we've seen in the oil sands, tar sands debate that are used. The, the, the premise of, of this work and the different case studies that I have written up have been about this is about the tossing back and forth of various sort of images. So we've gone away from discussion. The sort of public imagination has become polluted with different tropes, whether it is about uh, hypocrisy um, or, uh, well, that seems to be the easiest one to use as opposed to discussion. And um, I can get into more details about the project, about the, uh, that later, but that's sort of where my work's at. Uh, I'm going back into the past right now for a research project on a CBC docudrama called Tar Sands that was aired in 1977 and then was the subject of a lawsuit by, the, by Peter Lougheed uh, and then became banned after that. So I'm doing a book and a documentary uh, on that right now. Oh, all right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Catherine Abreu. I'm the Executive Director at Climate Action Network Canada. How many of you have heard of Climate Action Network? Ah, great. That's helpful. Uh, so we're an umbrella organization. We have 110 member organizations coast to coast to coast. And our members care about how a changing climate affects people, places, and wildlife. Our membership, of course, includes pretty much every environmental organization you could name in Canada, but it's very diverse. We also have labor unions like Unifor, Canadian Labor Congress, and our membership, faith groups, United Church of Canada, humanitarian organizations like Oxfam, health groups, youth groups, uh, the Assembly of First Nations. So it makes for a very rich dialogue, and we help Canadians who care about climate change uh, come to shared goals and speak with a unified voice that can influence policy development at various orders of government, whether municipal, provincial, territorial, or federal. We also work quite often at the intersection between the domestic and the international. So we represent Canadian civil society at a lot of international events that have to do with climate and clean energy. Uh, and as a person of mixed ethnicity, I think a lot about how I can do my part to help the Canadian environmental movement look and a lot more like the communities that it works uh, with and in, because um, it doesn't often look like those communities. Uh, so a few questions that are kind of sitting in my mind, having um, been present for the first part of today's conversation and having been able to engage in the great work of positive energy over the last few years. Um, Number one, I think we in this space often have a conversation like we're just considering a variety of options. And the reality is that one of the things that we talk about in this space is not an option, that's climate action. For those of us who want to live on this planet for a lot longer, um, taking action on climate change is not optional. So I think it's important for us to keep that in mind. And an addendum to that is Climate action is not just carbon pricing. That's been getting all of the hype lately, but there are a number of different ways to approach uh, climate change. Carbon pricing is an important part of the mix. It's a, one of the tools in the toolbox we need to be using all the tools. Number two, polarization doesn't happen by accident. Polarization is done. And so when we talk about polarization, I think it's useful for me 
to ask who benefits from it. Where is the power who benefits from this polarization? On that note, there's been a number of uh, references to a lack of literacy, and this is something that I talk about in my work a lot. There's a lack of energy literacy in Canada, a lack of kind of civic role responsibility, uh, literacy, I should say, a lack of uh, perhaps scientific literacy to some extent. If every single Canadian isn't able to hold all of those pieces of complex information in their mind, or if they're not all experts, they are looking to the experts or to government decision makers to help guide some of the ways that they think about and move through these decisions and concepts. So I think it's also incumbent upon us to think about how we are presenting this information outward. Number four, I think we're missing a little bit of a conversation about how this all plays into economic diversification and the courage it takes to move forward a conversation about economic dis diversification in this country. And that links to um, one of the images that's been coming across the screen where someone's presenting a variety of the uh, consequences of climate action. We build communities that are easier to get around. There's less pollution. And someone in the audience raises their hand and says, but what if climate change is all a hoax and we make the world a better place to live for nothing? And so often we are missing a conversation about the co-benefits of a bunch of these things, including climate action. So let's put those concepts on the table. That was great, Kat. Thank you. Tansi, ki ami di lir sa Crawford dishne kaushun Calgary pita kran to niwi ken pi mi fami penetangwe shin pi Jamaica niwi kan. Bonjour, je m'appelle Larissa Crawford. Durant le temps de questions, si tu es plus confortable de me demander des questions en français, je peux faire ma mieux. <laughs> um, hello, good afternoon. My name is Rose Crawford. Um, I just introduced myself acknowledging my ancestry. Um, I think it's really important um, in professional spaces to acknowledge where you're coming from and how you came to this place. Um, and I'll get a bit more into that as we go on in our conversations. Um, but it, I also use my ancestry to frame what I do. So I'm an indigenous and anti-racist researcher. Um, and I bring that research to the energy sector. And a lot of people ask me, well, what does race have to do with it? What does race have to do with energy? Um, but it has a lot of things to do with it. And so um, as an indigenous researcher, I pursue research that's for and by indigenous people using indigenous methodologies and ways of knowing and centering that knowledge. And then as an anti-racist researcher, I'm looking at systems and identifying um, spaces of uh, systemic racism and how racism is playing out in our interpersonal um, uh, relations, but then also in our systems and policies. Um, and so I've built my capacity to be able to speak to an audience like you um, through my work with government. So with the Ontario Ministry of Energy, I was an Indigenous Policy Advisor. Um, I've worked with the Anti-Racism Directorate out of Ontario's Ministry of um, the Solicitor General. We just changed our name. Um, and then right now through contract research um, with the federal government. Um, but I also am able to speak to a youth perspective me, myself being 24, but then also working um, constantly and really actively with youth, um, oftentimes with Meredith, actually, um, with student energy, um, and then delivering trainings and public speaking and engaging with youth and what we're thinking about through our activism, through our research, through our work. Um, and then as through my lived experience, I guess, as an indigenous, a black Albertan, um, I think that I come at the intersections of a lot of spaces and a lot of identities that, that see that polarization. And so um, a lot of my life and my work is committed to understanding those tensions um, and solutions to those tensions. Um, and I, I try to do that through culture camps, um, through engaging in research with Indigenous communities, but then also through resource extraction workforce. Um, and I've been able to do that through a number of opportunities where these capacities have been able to open doors for me. So um, through the G7 um, summit with the youth, um, the youth seven um, summit delegation, um, with the Women's Forum, with the United Nations, with Student Energy, and then through the Action Canada Fellowship, which is a, a intergenerational <coughs> fellowship and interdisciplinary as well. And so I'm working with 
people outside of the energy sector. And because of that, I learned so much about the energy sector. And we have so much opportunity to talk with um, coal miners, to talk with um, people working um, on the oil sands. And so it's, it's been a really interesting experience, but all of that work informs what I do. And so I do this through contract research, public speaking, <coughs> organizational training. Um, and I'll speak a bit more to what I see in the sector from my point of view. Um, but as of right now, um, I guess the most important thing is that I see my work as a future ancestor. And I think all of the work that we do is um, through the lens of a future ant um, through the lens of being future ancestors. And so I'm aiming to make sure that I'm not the kind of ancestor that my future generations are going to feel they need to make reparations for, if they make it that far. Um, and I think that that's really important. And again, I'll, I'll speak to it a bit more as um, our panel goes on. But um, this is also Zyra. Sorry, I forgot to introduce her. Zyra, she's two years old. This is her second conference within the span of like three days. Um, so she's a little tuckered out. Um, but I think it's really important to bring children to spaces like this. I think it really reminds us of why we're doing the work that we're doing. Um, and it always kind of lightens the moon. Everyone smiles at a toddler. <laughs> and if you don't, you know to stay away. So, um, But yeah, this is Zyra, and she'll be joining us today, too. Thank you. Well, welcome, everyone, especially our youngest panelist. Um, all right, this is your second moment of audience participation before we kick off with my question. So I actually need you all to take out your cell phones. Um, because we have one question where you'll text your answer to a word cloud. Um, so, and I don't have this up on a slide, so I need you to actually do it with me. Um, so you'll be texting to the number 37607. Or maybe it is on a slide now. 37607. Oh, it made it, yes. Okay, so it's the number up there, and you're gonna text Marissa Beck 169 and then it'll let you into the system. I know this is a little complex. Um, uh, and it's all one word. So you'll text the number, and then you'll text Marissa Beck 169. And then once you're in, I would like you to text the answer to the question, what is ideally one word? Um, a key component of creating a solution to, or solutions towards polarization. Say that again. A key component um, towards creating a solution for polarization. And if this works, we will have a nice word cloud. All right, someone successfully did this. Yes, great. Um, perfect. So now I'm going to open up with a few questions for our panelists to keep the keep the questions to keep the conversation going while we work on that. Word map, um, keeping an emphasis on the fact that we are looking towards what are solutions amongst all of our different perspectives. Um, so, for all of our panelists, to just really dive right in, in one sentence, where do you see the greatest opportunity for developing solutions towards polarization? To me, the greatest opportunity is to transform. I mean, you mentioned co benefits. But in fact, I think the approach is not to seek co-benefits, but to look at benefits and tie them in. If you want to have improvement in society, <coughs> you cannot imagine by simply reducing greenhouse gas emission you'll get there. If you want to have people to buy in, they have to see their interest, short-term and uh, near interest. And that's are the benefits. And no, the same thing, if you want to optimize a function, I'm kind of physicist, I'm not just kind, but if I want to optimize a function of two variables and I only want to optimize one variable, by m magic, the other one will not be optimized. So if I want co-benefits, I should not treat them as co-benefits, but as benefits. That's what I want in, as I move forward. And this vision is essential if we want to, to get this transformation going. If we just believe that by talking about climate change, we'll get uh, enough buy-in, it will not be sufficient. We need to show that on the daily level, on the family level, collective, community level, we are also going. And that's the only way we can progress, I think, and go above this polarization. Because this polarization is about very much how do I pay, or do I uh, benefit, or do I lose in this transformation. And this polarization is real. 
politicians are building on it clearly, but in communities, people are feeling it. When you look at polls, it's not only a construct by politicians. It's clear that it's used by politicians, but it's there, and we need to address it. We cannot ignore it. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's absolutely the case, and that's why I, I brought up that frame that um, we need to be speaking about the benefits of climate action as well as the benefits of, of really any kind of collective societal undertaking. Um, something that is clearly helpful because a lot of these decisions, a lot of the ways in which people understand these issues happens at a deeply personal level at the community scale. Um, having tangible examples that people understand in their daily lives of what transition looks like is, I mean, I, feel, I think the benefits of that are pretty incalculable. Um, I, for instance, recently spoke to one of the community members of Eden Mills. Have, have you guys heard of Eden Mills? So yeah, Eden Mills, Monica's heard of Eden Mills, great. Uh, <laughs> um, we were at the same conference the other day, so uh, it helps. Um, Eden Mills is a community, uh, it's a pretty small community that uh, is aiming to achieve net zero emissions. And it they have undertaken this project um, as a kind of whole of community project. And they started with a kind of precedent setting uh, renovation of their community hall. So their community hall is now 93% net zero. And they've re radically reduced their emissions while also growing their capacity to capture emissions in the community over the course of the last number of years. And people are doing it for a variety of reasons. A number of folks are really motivated to take that action because they care about climate change, and a lot of other folks are motivated to take that action because they see it as an opportunity to revi revitalize some of their community services. So those kinds of uh, projects are really helpful, and I think we've seen that in renewable energy as well, that when we design community feed into we'll get to see the benefits firsthand of these kinds of new energy projects, it can be, it can be really game changing. So I think that's got to be a part of the picture. Um, but of course, it's not always possible. So how do we um, create the opportunity for people who have some of those hands-on experience to communicate their experience to others? And I think trying to grapple with that to create, open up some of these channels of communication so that those illustrative experiences can be shared um, needs to be a part of the conversation as well. I would bring in examples of where we saw high degrees of polarization in the past that we no longer see them today. And I'll give you two very prominent examples, both of which are roughly in the, in the lifetime of everybody in this room. Uh, the first is free trade. Uh, the most divisive election I've ever seen in my life uh, was the 1988 election, and that was over policy, and that was over free trade. And yet, to imagine when they were renegotiating NAFTA for the Liberal Party to bring in Brian Mulroney as an advisor to tell them how to negotiate, John Turner would just be, well, I don't think he's dead yet, but if he was, he would be rolling in his grave uh, to, to see that. There is now a massive consensus on free trade that didn't exist 30 years ago. It took time and it took a gutsy government to go through that process, stay the course, and polarization ended. The second, more recently, is same-sex marriage. Very divisive issue. And it was forced on the hands of government by the courts, but there's nobody that is trying to reopen that debate, except for perhaps the liberals saying, threatening that the conservatives will reopen that debate. No, no, par no serious party is gonna reopen that. And that's over values. And if we think about the toughest thing is when it comes to values, time heals a lot. It takes government leadership and time. Is this working? Perfect. Yeah. Um, I'd say 
in, in one sentence, um, we need, to, we need to establish a shared history and understand a shared history to understand our shared responsibility to our shared future. Um, and, and if I go more into that, and maybe just to give an example, I know that sounds really theoretical, um, but those are, are really the, the values behind reconciliation. Um, and I think that's really applicable to indigenous and non-indigenous peoples and groups alike. And one example, and this is a non-energy example, but this is what I'm talking about when I've learned so much about the energy sector from non-energy sector related case studies. Um, in the Yukon, I was just in the Yukon for about two weeks, and we came across um, the people who worked at um, Kluani First Nation, um, at Kluani First Nation. But um, in, in 1948, um, a huge area in the Yukon um, was closed off for the Kluani Game Sanctuary. And in that process, the First Nations that were living there and who had used that land for millennia were violently removed from that land. Um, and it was a very traumatizing process. And when I say violently, I mean that a lot of people died in that process. A lot of oral traditions were disrupted. Um, stories were lost. It was, it was a very traumatizing process. But then in 1972, when the game sanctuary became Kluani National Park and Reserve, the First Nations were allowed to go back and hunt and harvest, but they didn't. And they didn't because of that history of trauma, that very recent in mind history of trauma. Um, and the park officials couldn't figure out why these First Nations weren't going back to these communities. Like, why? Like, we're, we're telling you you can, but you can't. And so they started this project, Healing Broken Connections. And through a four year project, they found that. Um, it, they found that it was the broken trust, it was the trauma, it was that shared history that only one side understood one. And so in that process, they came together, they had open dialogue, they had space to express their pain, but then also to express their guilt um, on the other side, on the National Park side. And so through this project came, um, came the capability to co-manage the park. And through that co-management scheme, we're seeing an amazing example of reconciliation, of co-management of the land, of the resources coming out of that land. And I think that really speaks to the idea of understanding their shared history. So through the Healing Broken Connections project, they began to understand that shared history and that process. And then through their, um, their work together and that shared responsibility to um, manage the land and and evaluate and assess the land, they began to shape a shared future. And they are doing amazing work. And a lot of places in Canada, throughout a lot of sectors, are looking to that example to see what can we be doing in our context, in our sector, to establish that shared history, move forward with a shared responsibility for a shared future. And I think that um, there are a lot of different ways that we can do that. Um, and maybe I'll save that for another question. Um, but I, I'd say that's where um, we're going to need to start in terms of polarization um, coming from Indigenous communities. Just briefly, uh, for me, I, I think one of the things I think about polarization is recognizing that, well, first off, thinking about where is the communicative space that we have to discuss these issues and, and recognizing that social media is not a deliberative space, it's a divisive space. And so turn, like, I think often when we're talking about like discourse, public discourse over energy, we often look back and think about social media, right? And it's not a space for this type of conversation. It's much more productive here. And you also think about the impact. Only 23% of Canadians are on Twitter. Yet a lot of the academic research focuses in on debates on Twitter, uh, and you think instead, um, you can look to Facebook where there's, uh, I have in my notes, uh, like 90%. Like but uh, the impact, I think, in how social media has changed this deliberative space to a divisive space, uh, the many reasons behind that is part of the challenge that we have in having conversations. Because again, from an institutional perspective, there aren't, there, there, there's a motivation to get short-term sort of uh, engagement. And I could go through the history of how that's evolved, but I'll leave it there. I would like just to come back on two things. Uh, first, on the question of uh, of the the change in perception for, well, regarding uh, free trade. The free trade changed because 
the economy adjusted also to this. So people who, were, who lost their job following free trade, found other jobs, moved on, and now moving back from free trade would change again the economy. So there's this transformation that is also associated with the transformation we're talking about. Did I lose? No, okay. So I think this aspect is true that it has changed, but it has changed because the society has changed a long way. That's what we're facing here as this, uh, this transformation is coming because climate change is much more like, it's much closer to free trade than it is to gay rights because for gay rights, it affects almost nobody. I mean, it affects gays, it affects maybe people around, but for most people, it didn't change their life. So that's a totally different aspect, I think. But free trade is a good example of something that changes the society and you have to build on it. And you were talking about story. The story is also because at one point, when you polarize, you see everything along this line. I mean, the question of oil, for example, the, the problem in Alberta is largely independent of climate change. It's mostly due to the fact that there's much easier oil Tight oil is much easier to exploit. You need less resources. So investment have moved down from Alberta, but nobody almost has presented it this way what's happening in Alberta. It was easier to keep the framing because it keeps in the policy and how par par partisanship is building up. So there's also this debate. We need to make sure that this discussion shows that not everything that is happening in Canada, bad or good, is due to this climate change issue. There's many other changes that we are facing in Canada. And it's important to avoid mixing these issues because then you just pile up on the polarization. Thank you. Um, Kat, did you have something you wanted to follow up with? If we're, yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry we were in this constant struggle with the microphones up here. Um, just on the, on the illustrative examples, I think one that I've been thinking about is, is healthcare, actually. And that's an interesting one because it started as a very polarized issue. Guess what? Some provinces sued the federal government over it. And, uh, and now, not only is it something that gov most governments would be loath to question, but it is, I think, actually a big part of the Canadian value system. Um, so an interesting one there, too. And so my next question, building on on what we've, so we've heard a lot now around both co-benefits, people adjusting, um, <laughs> sorry, I think this is on, um, people <laughs> adjusting, um, adjusting to change over time, and then really around this shared history, and I think, um, and I think that the healthcare system is, is an interesting one, you know, it's something where we debate the best way to do a premium, whatever, but we don't debate if it should exist, and so, um, and then on this end of the room, all of you have chimed in quite a bit. Uh, obviously, trust is the big one, but you're seeing a lot around courage, diversification, engagement. I saw empathy up there. And so these are a lot of interesting and I think core human values that we're starting to see come out around how do we think about solutions to polarization and how do you make these holistic, big societal changes that really do work for more people. Um, and so on that, I think my next question is really, um, you know, we see, and it actually gets to Patrick's point on Twitter quite a bit, you know, we see a lot of this, oh, well, thought leaders say X, or like, and you have quite loud groups on either end, and often their main platform is, is Twitter, but as Patrick pointed out, not, there's not really that many Canadians that are there on that conversation. So who is it that we need to really be including in this conversation, and what would it look like if we had different types of people at the table in terms of how we create solutions around polarization and create solutions for the future of energy. The, okay, cool. Um, I think that there does need to be more intergenerational collaboration. And I say that because um, on Saturday, I was at a youth um, climate action conference and and I found that it, it was different in atmosphere, it was different in the way that we talk about these issues, and it was different in what we focused on than this event here. Um, and we were missing people like you at that event. And I, I think you guys are missing people like well, who were at that event here. And it really shapes the conversation. Um, and, and I'd say that I'd say that, that that 
needs to be more at our organizational level in terms of youth doing a better job at engaging um, <laughs> different generations um, in our work, but then also that we need to have more access to these kind of spaces. Oh, thank you. <laughs> community, it takes a community. <laughs> Um, but that it, um, yeah, sorry, uh, more intergenerational opportunities. So talking about this fellowship, Action Canada Fellowship, um, we have people from Me24 to people 60 plus on this fellowship, and we learn so equal amount from each other. Not only that, but um, in terms of um, in terms of looking at even our election, um, our who's a, sorry, who's able to vote. <laughs> Um, I was listening to a podcast yesterday about um, research around uh, people who have been voting for 20 years are less likely to vote anything different depending on the political agenda. Whereas youth are extremely critical about these political agendas, particularly on climate change. So what would be the impact of lowering the voting age? What would that look like for parties and how they promote their policies and what kind of policies they're focusing on? And for many youth, we're reflecting that climate action and climate change is at top of mind. And so looking at who we're able to decide who the decision makers are, I think is a really big piece. Um, when, we're ta when I'm talking about bringing youth in and making opportunities accessible for us, that means funded opportunities. That means inviting more than just one of us and creating comfortable spaces where we can be heard and where we can say what we want to say without feeling alone or alienated. Um, and different sections like that, and sometimes that may mean bringing a youth onto your board or hiring youth, hiring students, and giving them meaningful power within the roles and responsibilities that they have. But I think that a lot of it's coming down to inviting each other to these spaces um, and more youth bringing in experts and not trying to do it alone and not trying to say we know everything because I'm hearing that. I'm hearing that organizations are struggling now because they don't have they don't have people that have been in the industry for 30 years and wouldn't be able to give the insight that Dwayne has been giving us today. We don't, we, a lot of organizations don't have that and so how can we be working together um, through intergenerational collaboration um, to move the to move the needle forward and to, to address some of this polarization that we're seeing between generations. I just um, something that and I get, something maybe something that I'm trying to figure out, and maybe there's an answer in the room from the panel is is thinking about well, looking at so the, the way that messaging over uh, over the oil sands tar sands has changed over time, and you see uh, it's not just issue polarization but identity polarization. You're seeing a doubling down, uh, this fusing of identity politics with energy politics. So I'm wondering where is the if you want to have this uh, larger conversation. Um, where is the space for the larger labor movement uh, in the environmental movement? How do we create that space and part of that? Uh, because it's something that we see some interesting case studies, but what is some work to do that? Especially thinking about, again, this fusion of I identity issues where energy workers often feel uh, vil vilified uh, and they feel that it becomes, this, again, this black and white, this for and against. So thinking through in terms of having conversations, I think part of this can come through, again, dialogue as such as this. Um, so it's something I'm still thinking about. Maybe there's, there's answers here in terms of how do we create a space? Because if you're being vilified, you want to feel better, right? And so then uh, you want to feel good about what, you, what you're doing. Everybody wants to. So then the messaging can reinforce and drive this polarization versus thinking about where is the space for labor in this space. Something else just to throw out there um, in terms of thinking about I don't think we're ever going to, you're never going to have a space where everybody agrees. You're always going to have different types of social movements with different goals. Some social movements might be, to, uh, there's always going to be uh, uh, groups. And, and Nick Nanos earlier, earlier referred to the fringe and almost vilified the fringe, and in in I felt at least, uh, sort of put the fringe as a bad thing. But I think actually some groups uh, can be sort of looking to push more progressive uh, legislation further. And so these groups are always going to be doing certain tactics which are, are not going to be looking to compromise. And so we need to think about sort of the, the, the diversity of tactics which is used by social, social movement groups and not aiming for a cohesive solution. But in, in terms of having a larger conversation, I'm wondering about the space for labor in this. It's something I can't resolve. <laughs> 
I would say we need to talk to everybody, of course, different messages, because contrary to many other issues, it touches the life of every single Canadian. This energy transition, what we're going through, uh, whether technologically, whether in terms of climate, again, there's many issues being linked to this, it will touch the life of every citizen in the way they move themselves, in what they buy, and how they are housed. So there needs to be a vision that touches all citizens, but of course you need to talk at the various groups, be they union, be they industrial groups, be they uh, politicians, so you need to talk to everybody, so that's just make it li simple, at least it gives us jump for some time, uh, but clearly it has, we need to talk to everybody. The issue of labor I, I, I find interesting um, because if you, if you look at the, the NDP historically has been the party of labor and somehow they have lost that. And so when you see the split between the federal NDP and the Alberta provincial NDP, I would say it's because the Alberta NDP is still tied into labor. Uh, the Alberta Federation of Labor and Gil McGowan and the, the realization of how many jobs are employed in the, in the oil sands, I think is, is very important. Um, and so the Notley government tried to balance those sorts of issues, and I would argue so did John Horgan. Um, you know, where, where the NDP in, in British Columbia does have its environmental wing and its labor wing and how to, how to balance those things. Uh, the issue of identity and symbols also struck me because symbols can sometimes backfire. Um, in the late stages of the Klein government around 2003, 2004, they were realizing that not enough Americans knew about the oil sands and how big it was and how much, you know, the scale and all of that. So they opened up an office in Washington and they put Murray Smith, uh, former Alberta energy minister, and he goes, I'll show you how big it is. And he drove one of the big oil sands trucks to the Smithsonian. And that just horrified environmental movement. So if you wonder why Alberta became a target, uh, why Keystone became a target, having an eight ton truck uh, in the parking lot of the Smithsonian was a backfire, right? They were trying to show the size and scale of the oil sands by showing the size and scale of the oil sands. And so those, those symbols matter more than any facts or evidence that I could be describing to you. And, and confronting that is very difficult. Um, yeah, on the point of labor, so in fact, uh, it's actually really useful in this instance to um, have a bit of an international perspective, because I can tell you that the labor and environmental movements in Canada are far closer together than they are in most other places that I have experienced. Um, and I'd be happy to share with you a paper I wrote on the history of those relationships. Uh, so a, a big part of the, the, or a big part of the framing around that relationship at this point is just transition. Um, and we heard a little bit of a case study on the just transition task force. Canada was the first country in the world to announce a national task force on just transition, specific to the coal sector in this case. Um, very interesting that a part of the current governing party's uh, election platform involves the construction of a Just Transition Act. It w that would be the first of its kind in the world. So there are actually some really close collaborations that happen in that space between labor and environment. And what I find is when I, for instance, go to the UNIFOR annual conference to speak about climate change, which I did recently, is I'm anticipating more animosity from oil sands workers than I get. And that takes me a little bit back to something that I raised at in the beginning of my comments, which is those of us who are thought leaders or those of us who are experts in this field come into it with a set of assumptions. And those assumptions affect the, the zeitgeist. They affect the ways in which all of these issues get spoken about. And so it's actually important for us to reflect on our own assumptions and the ways in which our own assumptions are shaping reality. Just putting. I'm an anthropologist by training, so just putting that out there. Um, <clears throat> and I would say that it, it actually behooves us to think about the ways in which um, all of these various infrastructure projects are symbols of something larger. So the last four years have really been defined by carbon pricing versus pipelines. It's not about carbon pricing and pipelines. It's about environmental protection 
and prosperity. Those are the things that people want. They're using these as stand-ins for those things. So how do we actually get into a juicier conversation about the things that people want? When people, you know, I, I, like when we talk about energy efficiency, it's better to talk about having cozier homes that cost less, right? Because what people are really looking for are the things that these buzzwords or these single point in projects that we talk about are stand-ins for. So I think useful for us to approach it from that perspective. And that's, I think, indeed what a part of this project is about. Thank you. And so I think we'll be opening it up to audience questions now as we just have about 15 minutes left. Um, and as we line some up, um, <laughs> I, um, I'm just finding some interesting reflections here around kind of this continued thought towards solutions relying on co-benefits and relying at what it is that people really want um, from the energy transition and how they really behave and interact with it. Um, and so we had a question here. Okay, one back there first. Okay. Um, I have a question about narratives. Um, we've talked about symbols. Um, just hoping you can elaborate a bit more on narratives. And just to set it, I'll say um, the um, Jason Kenney recently retweeted uh, or an announcement by Greengate Power of a 400 megawatt solar project in rural Alberta. Um, one of the largest solar projects in the world now, just announced a few weeks ago in Alberta. And um, so that, coming from, you know, the architect of the anti-climate leadership plan, the, you know, the man, the, 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 the war room, our, <laughs> the uh, firing of Ed Whittingham, you know, the chief polarization officer, maybe we could say, is, uh, <laughs> but on the... <laughs> But he spotted an opportunity there for that announcement to reinforce the political narrative that he, uh, that he and his party were advancing. And, and I've got to say, it did so quite masterfully. So um, I just wonder if anyone has uh, any examples of any unifying narratives that you've um, seen or experienced or that you, you, know, you see evidence of or... Um, any reflections on that or on narratives? And I would say in Quebec, for example, the, the fact that Quebec moved in relatively early on climate change is really built on the pride that people have in Hydro-Quebec and in uh, low carbon electricity. So that was really building on uh, something that was many decades old. And even though we are, now there's a lot of emissions, there's a lot in consumption and other uh, aspects, but really that made people uh, support the initiative since the early 2000. There we go. Um, and then maybe on on the flip side, having conversations about harmful narratives, I've seen has derived like the depolarization of these conversations, at least in the minds of those who took part in that dialogue. And I'm thinking specifically to a workshop where we looked at the, the frontier kind of rhetoric around Alberta's oil sands. And this idea that development of those oil sands is going to benefit all Canadians. When in fact, if we look at the data, it's highly racialized, highly gendered. And so when we had that conversation, when we looked at the frontier rhetoric, we broke it down in terms of its colonial kind of background, um, but then also the impacts and how it's impacting people differently and how this pursuit of um, this economic prosperity is really only benefiting some people to, to break that down with people who, who aren't Indigenous and non-Indigenous who came to that workshop with a lot of different backgrounds to see that process of really looking at that and establishing that, again, shared history and to establish the shared realities of what that rhetoric actually looks like um, played up in terms of a lot of people connecting and moving forward um, with a different understanding of why there is this tension between groups right now. So I think just as much as setting positive narratives, we have to reflect critically on the narratives that we're seeing right now. <laughs> 
Um, I, I don't have a question. I'd like to make a comment and perhaps even add a case study to your list. I'm David Runnels. I'm a senior fellow at the Institute for the Environment at the University of Ottawa. I suppose more importantly for this, I'm also the chairman of the board of the Pembina Institute, Jason Kenney's favorite organization. Uh, and something you said a minute ago about narratives reminds me of something. We've been trying to create spaces for civilized conversations in Alberta about the issues. And we've set up something called the Alberta Narratives Project, which we've done with funding from Suncor, uh, the Ivy Foundation, Pat Carlson, who's a well-known energy entrepreneur from Calgary, and a number of others. And it's really an attempt to, and we've had now about 60 of these things in small and large towns and communities in Alberta. And it's not a permanent propaganda exercise. It's really an attempt to work with George Marshall of Oxford about how you create a space for people to have a conversation without shouting at each other to begin with. And it's actually been modestly successful. We've probably reached well over a thousand people just in this kind of format. Uh, and it seems to be getting a bit of a momentum on its own. And if there's any place that's more divided in terms of polarization, it's Alberta. We've also had some success with another divide, which nobody up here has mentioned, which is the rural-urban divide. Rural areas in Canada are grossly overrepresented in every provincial legislature. They're grossly overrepresented in Parliament. And yet these sorts of discussions don't really take place in small towns. Or very rarely do they take place in small towns. And a number of these we've managed to run in small communities in Alberta, which are incredibly dependent on the oil sands. And it's not just people working in the oil sands, it's supply industries and everything else. It's not the be all and the end all, but so far the results have been kind of encouraging. There's a, a couple of reports on the Pemina website for anybody who's interested in this, but, but it, it does at least get people to have a conversation about something other than climate change. Uh, and the key to the thing clearly is to get people to talk about something other than that. So it's, it's a modest beginning, but it's one of the larger conversations around about public science. So I present that to you as a possibility. I, I want to jump in on that, that rural-urban divide uh, and just give a bit more context from, from the Alberta case um, in, in several respects, because there were other uh, errors, I believe, that the Notley government made during its time, um, the, the farm bill, rural crime, and it all seemed to, uh, and climate change, if you're in rural Alberta as well, and they just seemed to be collapsing. Uh, when you had one of the ministers, it wasn't Shannon Phillips, it was someone else, say, well, you know, just take public transit. Uh, when you're living in Hanna, um, there is no LRT there. So here's a sense, so you, you heard, you know, large majority government for Jason Kenney, 62 seats, 53% of the vote, but there's 46 seats in Calgary and Edmonton. UCP took 23, 23 out of 46. The rest of the seats, 41, they took 39 out of 41, right? So this was not an overwhelming victory. This was a rural backlash against the NDP. And those were not winning by a little bit. Those were winning with 70%, 65% of the vote. So the rural urban really mattered in, in this election. And I, I mentioned this to um, Stephen. You know, when we look at climate change as being the number one predictor of party support, you overlap that with the regional splits that correspond to party support. Then you correspond that to rural urban that correspond to region that correspond to party support and you have these multiple layers all picking in. So you're exactly correct on that rural urban issue. Hi. Hi. Oh, great. Um, just in the light of uh, the earlier research this morning about the those two realism narratives, realism one and realism two, is it necessary for elites to have an agreement on problems, what the problem is, for us to have shared solutions on climate action. I would say we don't want to have agreement on climate action, on the action. I mean, that should be the debate we're facing now, is because that defines the vision. Where do we want to be as a society? 
And there's many solutions. And I think it's part of the problem is that the way it's been framed often climate action, action is really it's kind of more on the left of the spectrum. So it kind of doesn't say there's right answer, I mean right in terms of political right answer to climate actions. And that's a different answer than on the left. Same thing for the just transition. What's the just transi transition? There's many definitions for that. So this has to be the debate. Uh, and now we're still debating should we act or not. But in large part, what should be the debate once we say we want to move, we want to be there, is the decisions. How do we act on every day? And this will not end. I mean, that's political. And this will continue. We have to start talking. And it's much more fun when we start discussing about is it the proper action or is it another one to reach the same goal? So there was an elite consensus in 2015 in Alberta. And it didn't work. And it didn't work because those that were critical were able to exploit that gap between elite and masses. When Brian Jean gets in the legislature, he was the Wild Rose leader, the official opposition leader, and, and blasts Rachel Notley for being in bed with big oil. If you just pause for a second <laughs> and think about the leader of the NDP being told that she's in bed with big oil, it just seemed preposterous, but there were a bunch of people who were, damn right she is, you know, and it replicates, uh, and I had a brief chat with, with Dave Collier about this, the split within the oil and gas sector. The very big companies, the ones that were on stage, the Synovuses, the Suncors, the CNRLs, the Shells, who operate around the world, see climate change. Those that operate in Alberta and Saskatchewan and Montana do not. And then it breaks down further when you look at who are the vol who are the volunteer base, who are the donor base of the Wild Rose Party, and the UCP is really the Wild Rose Party um, in in uh, in form. Uh, you see that split being replicated again, and so the, the NDP focused too much on getting that elite consensus. They forgot about everybody else, and telling people you know in Hannah just to take public transit, you know, uh, didn't help that very much. Uh, Kat, did you have something else? Yeah, I, I was going to make a couple of those points, but probably not as well, because I haven't recently written a research paper on it, but that was great. Uh, uh, so that that's an example of a, a, the larger point that I wanted to make, which is that actually I think often there is a certain level of consensus amongst the elite, um, particularly when we're talking to each other as human beings behind closed doors. Uh, but we get leveraged against each other by politicians and by the media. We often, and I, I'm saying we because like this is the case for me as the head of Climate Action Network Canada, we're often just two opposing quotes in a media story, right? Yeah. That is how, like that's how we... They're imbalanced. Yeah, so, um, so, so what I think and what I've tried to bring into my work in particular in the last year is how can we facilitate those conversations? How can we facilitate conversations like this but then actually action them so that we're communicating some of this consensus outside and actually articulating our, our resentment and our disagreement when we're used against each other in ways that actually don't reflect how we feel about these issues. Awesome. Um, so we are just about out of time for this panel. Um, and so I was just going to take one final moment um, to bring up how we started and how we started thinking about the feelings around polarization and then now where we're getting to thinking through solutions. And I think the feelings about polarization around anxiety and fear um, versus what we have up here are mostly relatively hopeful words on, on what could be around <laughs> solutions. Um, and then what we've heard on our panel today, a lot about co-benefits and a lot about solutions really being a bit more ground level and, and thinking through people's experience with the transition and how, how we ease into it and make it like healthcare, make it the thing that we don't debate if we should do it, but it's more the details of how. And so I'd like to invite our panelists to each give just one very quick sentence. You're standing between people and dessert and coffee um, as to what you think the best next step is on a solution. It doesn't have to be the very best. It's not, <laughs> it's not a do or die situation. I think we have const to construct visions to give uh, hope to people that they can go through this transformation.
yeah, I, related to that, I think moving beyond the binaries we see in discourse to have a free up the sort of public imagination for better conversations. Governments need to make tough decisions. They need to stick by them, uh, and that changes things. It may not change them in every circumstance, but change can occur, but governments have got to be committed, and usually it'll be in the first five months of what they do. Uh, earlier when you asked Meredith, Meredith what the one word was when we hear the word, what our feeling is when we hear the word polar, polarization, and my feeling is bored. I think then, and I don't mean I'm bored of this work. I think this work is great, but I feel like the the conversation we've been having is boring as a country. So the best thing I think we can do on October 21st is to vote for someone who's going to have a more interesting conversation for us. <laughs> uh, if I would to summarize like my thoughts. I think it would, it would be around shaping how we have these conversations and that, got back, that gets back to my point about intergenerational collaboration because what I'm seeing here today is very different in a lot of good ways and in a lot of ways that youth could fill that gap. And I think that it's really important to acknowledge that and for us as youth to do a better job at bringing y'all to where to our conversations um so i think that that's um because we have a lot of we have a lot of thoughts and solutions and uh, so many that i couldn't summarize them here but we have really good ideas and oftentimes we don't have access to the spaces where we could influence mind, minds like yours and we need minds like yours to influence our thought and to inform us on on our history and on what's actually working in the sector and what's not. And so I, I'd say intergenerational collaboration is, um, is a huge piece to the solution that we'll need to see.